First, I'd like to go ahead and start with a story. And now I need to go ahead and make sure that I have a better idea of how this is actually coming across. Yeah, that looks fine. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and tell you a story about Belinda. Belinda is, oh, I'm gonna say she's early 20s. And Belinda went ahead and decided that the university was not for her. Belinda didn't want to go ahead and spend a lot of time studying something that she felt that she was never going to use. She wanted to get her hands dirty. He wa she wanted to get her hands dirty right away. So she decided, forget that education stuff. I'm going to do what I've always wanted to do, and that is to play music. So what Belinda did was she set herself up in a punk band. And so Belinda has been playing music for a while. And, you know, of course, the, the people that Belinda associates with, they, um, they are sustainably minded, so to speak. And Belinda has been reading a lot about this just because she didn't go to university. doesn't mean that this, that Belinda is not a clever young woman and very inquisitive, but Belinda wanted to do it on her time, the way that she wanted to go ahead and do it. So Belinda studied this idea of sustainability and started to make some very conscious decisions about what she bought and to make sure that the, the sources were reputable. And the last thing she wanted to do was get involved with that greenwashing stuff. Let me explain to you what greenwashing is. That's when these companies get together and they, they offer you a product and they claim it's sustainable. And in reality, it's not sustainable. And of course, when you're the, cons the, the customer and you find these things out, then you're not a very happy person. So uh, let's go ahead and continue with the story with Belinda. So Belinda, she went ahead and did some research. She needed to buy some clothes and she wanted to make sure that the company that she would buy this clothes from, that they're sustainable. So as you could tell, Belinda lives in London. Belinda went down to Camden Yard and found a shop and she was starting to think, hmm, I'm not so sure because that's a pretty trendy area and for the most part, I don't really think that you're going to find anything sustainable there, but she she got words from her friends. Yeah, that's pretty legit. And so she decided to go ahead and down, down to Camden Yard to go in and buy some clothes for herself. So she went into the shop and she was a bit suspicious, And but the she talked to some of the people that were working there and they seemed pretty cool. And she she told told the group what, what her interests were and that she was a little bit concerned. And, and the people more or less tried to assure her that yeah, this stuff is fine. So she's looking at the clothes and she sees this label, the one that you see on your screen right, right now. She sees this label and said, this does not sound right. This label certifies that this garment has been constructed with the highest quality fabric. Now, I don't know about you, but that reminds me of these commercials that you have on TV late at night where they said, yeah, trust me, this is an original. So she was a bit suspicious, but she thought, okay, let's give it a try. The person behind the counter seemed pretty cool and, and this person ins insisted, yeah, this is, this is a legit place. So, oh, and there was something else that I need to tell you about this, this deal that, um, that Belinda was offered. They said that they would take her old clothes. So they thought, okay, good, let's go ahead and give it a try. But now it starts getting interesting. Let me go ahead and tell you a little bit more about the, the, the story. So she found out that actually these clothes were being made in Bangladesh. And in fact, okay, they were in a, in a separate area but down the down the hall you have H&M and Primark being produced so I said that doesn't seem very sustainable to me but the story gets even better so she found out that her old clothes were going to be part of an exhibition as you can see in this picture here what they uh, this artist decided to go ahead and take all these old clothes and make a statement tied to consumerism. Interestingly enough, you, as you can see, it's, ta it's, it's taking place within uh, a shopping mall. And so that was the whole idea. So Belinda's clothes ended up on this pile. 
And it gets even better. So what happened after the exhibition was, was finished? They ended up going ahead and burning the clothes. And of course, Belinda found out about all this later on. She was not very happy, but then she thought, well, it could have been worse. It could have been exported to Africa where we would have gone ahead and ruined the market. So I wanted to go ahead and start with a, a story like this just to give you an idea of some of the challenges that we have when we keep talking about circularity or sustainability because there's a lot of talk out there and it's a little bit difficult to actually go ahead and validate whether the offer that we have is truly circular or sustainable. Just wanted to remind you, if you have any questions, and this is a little bit of an experiment for me because I've never taught a lecture like this. I've held a number of live streams, but I've never tried to hold a lecture like this. So I'm counting on you to actually go ahead and use the chat box. So if you have a question for me, go ahead and, and submit it in the, in the chat box. And I think what I'll do is I'll go, I'll figure out ways while we move forward, maybe how I can go ahead and prompt you to go ahead and use the chat box moving forward. Okay, good. Let's move on to Definition. So what is this idea of circularity? What are we actually talking about? Basically, we're talking about getting rid of waste. And when, if, if we think about the, the general term and everything that we take from nature that we bring back, then that means that we shouldn't really have anything like waste. Everything should be a nutrient and everything should be, should be used by nature at some time so that we can actually go ahead and close the loop. But I guess, of course, the, the concept is a little bit more detailed than that. But I wanted to start with a um, description of perhaps what I consider one of the biggest problems to be. If you take a look at this information, now I need to go ahead and see whether you can see this very well. I'm going to go ahead and make a switch. That makes it a little bit better. Yes, if you could see the information on your screen, the these are the figures of millions of tons being generated in the United States going back to 1960, the latest statistics being 2017. If you look, going back to 1960, 88.1 million tons, that it took us maybe about 20 years to go ahead and double that figure. And you might think, well, it's relatively stable, it's not so bad. Actually, it's really bad. That's really bad, but there's something even worse. Let me go ahead and do this. But there's there's something even worse, worse than actually having this figure. Then let's go ahead and move to the next slide. A lot of lessons learned for me on this one. Take a look at this figure, waste management, 112.2 billion dollars that is generated in the United States in 2017. So I ask you the question, if you have a business of $112 billion, are you gonna give that up easily? Hmm? What do you think? Yes, no, maybe? Or do you consider that to be a rhetorical question? Well, here's the real issue that we have, folks. If we have a business that thrives on our waste, then they have no interest. They have no interest in actually uh, getting rid of waste because that's how they make their money. That's how they make their money. Let's go ahead and continue. And I, I take it for a number of you, you'll be familiar with this model. It's called the, the linear model, take, make, and dispose. Let me go ahead and describe this to you. So you, we take from nature without giving back. We make things, we produce things that um, maybe people might need or maybe they don't need, but we consider the actual production to be growth. And at the end, we just go in, we don't know what to do as a customer. So what we do is, Sorry, let's go back. You know what we do? 
we take the trash and we throw it away. And that's exactly where we're going. And that, my friends, is the problem that we find ourselves to be in. So let's go ahead and continue. Right, so if that is the linear model, what does the circular model look like? Oh, sorry, before I go there, um, got another question for you. If we go ahead and wait until we solve the problem at the end with the, the actual trash, how efficient do you see that to be? There's a, a saying that we have, it's called the end of pipe cleanup. And here you can see on this picture on the screen of sewage going into a river. And so if we solve the problem, if we were to cap this pipe, what would happen? Any thoughts? Okay, I see there's a bit of a lag. This isn't going to work out as well as I thought it would be. But that's okay. That's all part of the experiment. Can you imagine if you were to put a cap on the pipes that actually go ahead and send the sewage out of your house? What happens? Right, exactly, Lewin. There would be endless trash. That means it's even worse than that. Can you imagine you put a, you put a, a, a cap on that, on that uh, pipe and then all of a sudden, the, 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 right, it will backfire, exactly. It will start coming back at us. And so all of a sudden, could you imagine going to the loo and you you put a cap on this pipe and all of a sudden the, 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 uh, is the re return of whatever you had the day before. And it's, it's a serious problem. And so if we were to look at this whole idea of solving the problem at the pipe, then we realize we're not solving any problem. We're just putting a Band-Aid on it. And in fact, we're not even doing that properly. So the if we're really going ahead and trying to make some progress, then we have to go ahead and approach it a little bit different. So here's the idea that we need to figure out some way to bring whatever is being left up from the, the, the disposed part, we need to figure out a way to bring it back. But the real question is, and I th I've thought about this one a lot. If we just brought it back, is that much better than actually going ahead and fixing the problem at the pipe? What's really missing here? Okay, again, I, I think there's a little bit of a problem with the lag. So I apologize for that. Um, let's look at it from a different way. If we make sure that we don't even get to the disposing part, that we, we bring the things back much early in the process, or even better, that it goes, goes ahead and corrects itself and we don't even have to bring anything back, I tend to think that's a little bit better of a solution, meaning that we need to go ahead and come up with a design to make it better right from the inception. And I think that's really the challenge that we need to go ahead and address. How about if we look at nature like a bank account? So what would that mean? So we, we have we have a bank account, we have money in the bank, and of course the whole idea is we can go ahead and spend, unless you're Donald Trump, we can go ahead and spend what's actually in the account. Or we can take a loan, which means that we need to go ahead and pay it back. 
but the idea would be that we don't take more than than what we actually have. What would happen if we were to go ahead and look at our relationship towards nature in the same way? If we were able to go ahead and say, we only we make sure that we bring back, do this way, we make sure that we bring back to nature what we took from it. And if we looked at nature as being like a bank account, and it said, well, we're gonna take something from you, but we're going to make sure that you get paid back. Maybe we could even go ahead and pay back nature with some interest. I'll talk a little bit about that later on with this concept called permaculture. And that's really the, the basis of, of permaculture. So let's move on. Here is the butterfly diagram. And perhaps some of you, I know some of you have uh, seen this before and I have one uh, individual who's joining me today it was very beneficial in me being able to show it to, to you. So thank you very much for that, Yana. Yes, uh, the butterfly diagram has been around for a while. It was originally uh, put together by uh, a concept called cradle to cradle, but the, the most popular version of the butterfly diagram actually comes from the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. I'll talk a little bit about, about cradle to cradle and the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. But let me go ahead, and it would help if I was to go ahead and show the screen. Another, this is all part of my learning experience here. I usually do these live streams, I don't bother with slides. So let me go ahead and explain to you what you see on your screen. There are two, there are two cycles that we're looking at here. One is a technical cycle, and the other one is a biological cycle. So a technical cycle is basically what we actually go ahead and, and produce, it's the materials that we, we mine from the ground, it's the resources or the generally the resources that we take, the parts that are actually created from that mining or whatever the resources may be, could be, could be virtually anything. And out of those parts, we make products. Out of, and from the products, uh, we obviously the idea is to go ahead and sell them to consumers. And once the consumers get them, then looking at the linear model, that's really the problem. They, it, it ends up as trash. And that's really not a solution. So if we're looking at technical cycles, what solutions do we have at our disposal? Let's concentrate on the, the cycle to be found farthest outside to the right, where it says recycling. You know, when we, we come we come from an, an environment, and I'm thinking about when I first came here to Austria, too many years to count, and I was very impressed. I lived in Germany for a while, and I thought, oh, this is certainly a lot better than what we had in the United States, and then Austria was even better. But the whole idea was tied to recycling. So the, real, the question I have for you is really, is recycling a, a good solution? So it's certainly better than throwing it away and it ending up in the ocean or a landfill, but just the same. That means we take all of this, all of this energy, and then we we destroy it or we bring it down to an element that can be used again. But the fact is, you never can really use the material one to one. There's a certain degradation that takes place, and very often we say that upcycling is actually downcycling. And so part of the problem that we have is part of, is part of the, this conditioning that we, we've gone through where we've thought the whole time, yeah, it was so great that we were actually going ahead and recycling, but the fact is we were kind of sold a bill, bill of goods and there has to be a better solution to that. So let's go ahead and continue with what we have on this model. So the next stop, stop would be refurbishing and remanufacturing. So refurbishing means that we, we have a product and we kind of spruce it up. So I have the save, for example, this oh, I have to show my screen. Otherwise, you don't know what I'm talking about. Let's do it this way. So I have this phone and, yeah, maybe the, the screen's broken. I have to go ahead and fix it. Maybe there's some other things that need to be fixed. In essence, it's still a used phone, uh, but it looks a little bit better and perhaps it function, functions a little bit better. And then, of course, we have the idea of remanufacturing. Now, remanufacturing means that you could use part, some of the parts, some of the parts you have to go ahead and take on new. And it's almost as if you have like a new phone. So that would be the next stop. 
still using a lot of energy, but uh, sometimes it's uh, certainly better than recycling and it's everything's better than just throwing it away. Let's go on to the next stop. The next stop would be reuse or redistribute. Redistrib so it, instead of actually going ahead and buying the new version every single time, or if we say that these are no longer in fashion, then uh, if we're able to break out of this mold, that means we keep things for a longer period of time. And, and that doesn't mean that you have to hold on to them yourself. Uh, perhaps you know somebody else who would like to have it. And I'm always thinking of whatever I have, I hate, th I hate, I hate throwing anything away. <laughs> Let's do this one. I hate throwing anything away. <laughs> And so um, instead of throwing it away, I'm always thinking who can actually who can actually use it? Who can actually who can actually use what I what I what I have that I really I don't have any use for it anymore. So I'm always thinking, well, maybe I can just give it to them or find somebody else who could use it. So that that's always a better solution. And keep it keep the life cycle cycle of the product going and and with that that's certainly much better than having to spend all the energy and fixing it obviously if you don't have a choice then that's the way it is and or recycling let's continue then and then lastly share which i think pretty much comes within the same direction of that i was describing and so of course these are different actions are taking place as you can see on on the technical cycle, they're happening at different touch points within the cycle. And if by the end, when you, if you can't use it anymore, then we just, we try to get the energy out of it, which means we burn it and create energy that way. Uh, and very often with the technical elements, it ends up in the landfill. So that would be the technical cycle. So now, now let's, let's try this. Now let's go ahead and move on to the left-hand side, which would be the biological. Biological means that everything is a nutrient. Everything you create can be used. So of course, that means that the cycles are going to look a lot of much different. We're gonna have um, still resources that we, that we require to go ahead and make these biological products. But of course, by nature, <laughs> and that was pun on words, by nature, they are built to go back to nature, so they can take on, they can have uh, different states and they can be used for different purposes. But the whole idea is, worst case scenario, it could be included into some sort of composting, which means that we're creating nutrients to be brought back into the system. And so, if you if you think about it, if if we have some proper goals here, we need to go ahead and try to bring as many of the things that are to be found within the technical cycles, we need to bring them over to the biological side. And of course, we have not talked about the main element that maybe makes circular economy a little bit different than some of the other models that we've had out there. So I want to tell you another story, and this concerns an election that took place in 1992 in the United States. We had Bill Clinton, remember him? Uh, he was running for president for the first time, and he had a campaign manager by the name of James Carville coming from Louisiana. And James Carville was very, he's an obsessive person, still is, he's still moving around, and James, wanted to make sure that whatever took place in the Clinton organization throughout the campaign, that there was one message, one, that they were bringing up, and that is all about the economy. So he made this huge poster that they hung up on the, in the headquarters of the, the Hilton, uh, sorry, of the, of the Clinton headquarters, um, campaign headquarters, and it stated, it's the economy stupid. So the whole idea is every time you would come into the headquarters, you would be confronted with these words, which would be subliminal to make sure that you're always concentrating on the economy. And I know this for some people, this seems like a funny example when we talk about the circular economy. But my take is that very often we tend to forget what motivates people. And I've been involved 
in these circles for a while, and I and I keep seeing the same thing over and over again. Apart from the fact that we keep talking about theory and we don't get our hands dirty and we don't try to make something happen here, we're either looking at it from an ecological perspective. Sometimes we'll look at it from an IT perspective, and uh, yes, of course, Sabrina, I'll go ahead and make sure that you have access to all the slides. The in fact, what I can do. What do you think of this? See, this is the great part about it. You can you can go ahead. This is what I like about the system. You can go ahead and ask me any time, and then you don't have to wait until I finish talking because, you know, part of the problem is sometimes I don't even stop talking, and that doesn't really help you at all. So let's see how this one works out. There you go. Oh, you even saw how I did it. Isn't that great? <laughs> all right, never mind. Uh, done. So let's go back to James Carville. James Car in, in the economy. Oh, yes, that's right. What, uh, what was I saying? Oh, I'm not going to keep this. This is a little bit uh, interesting live stream. Never mind. The As I was mentioning, we either talk about the ecology, sometimes we'll talk about IT, but very seldom do we have people that are coming from the economy element that are involved in, in what we're talking about. And the fact is, if we're if we're not able to come up with businesses that can live from sustainable approaches, if we don't have customers that have incentives to go ahead and buy sustainably, then it's always going to be a niche. It's going to be a very small element of the society that is going to be interested in this. And we're clearly not going to be able to solve our problems. So to a certain degree, it means we need to come up with new economic models, getting past the whole idea of gross domestic product where we're producing things that people don't really need, that cannot, that's not sustainable because we keep using resources and at the end we just throw it away. And that's really what's led us to this problem that we that we were confronted with here, right? So we need to come up with new economic models. And, and in fact, moving forward in this class, I'd like to have a little bit more of a focus on, on these components, but I need to give you the the basic information, what we're really talking about tied to the circular economy. So let's move on and I'm gonna go ahead and change the view here. This is Aristotle. And Aristotle was concerned about this concept of economy. And it was very, very interesting. Aris um, going back in Aristotle was a number of years ago. I tend to think you know that one already. And look at his definition of economy or the oikonomia household management to create value for all now that sounds a little bit different than what we consider economy to be today so the whole idea was to go ahead and make sure that everybody prospers and that was the original idea of economics but there's another term that aristotle talked about and that was called srebrenistics. And, and I think we when we look at srebrenistics, oh, that's a, that's a mouthful, srebrenistics, don't try to say that five times in a row, uh, it's the manipulation of property for a short-term gain, or it could be considered to be the, the, the study of wealth. And so you, as you can see, the whole idea back then was that Aristotle was, made a clear differentiation between what, econo what economics means and what, and how that actually goes ahead and helps society in comparison to the study of wealth. So I, I ask you the question, if Aristotle knew back then what the right economic model should be in creating value for everybody. When he's talking about household, he's actually talking about society. If he knew back then what we need to do from an ec economic perspective, then nobody, nobody can tell me that we cannot come up with the same. Now, we might not be able to do this by the 18th of November when this course ends, but we can certainly damn try. Let's go ahead and continue. Now I move on to history. 
and this is, might be a little bit biased, um, but I'll come up with some local examples to make it this all relevant. Does anybody, some of you might already know this one, uh, the original idea of wasteland. Now, if you look at this picture, you're gonna say, okay, yeah, the, 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 the ground or nature has been ruined. But that wasn't the original idea of what wasteland was all about. This was a concept coming from good old England, and it was to be found between the mid the mid 18th century until around 1820. And the whole idea was that you have wilderness that is not being exploited, that's a waste. So we call this wasteland. What does this actually mean? This means that you are trying to exploit anything that you that you have at your disposal. And the, the most unfortunate fortunate part of all this is that they did not just consider it just to be the land per se. Does anybody know, anybody else know what was taking place around the middle of the 18th century? So 1750 or maybe a little bit earlier? What was taking place in the world? Not so much in this area, not in Central Europe. But if you looked at England or Spain, and I'm giving you a hint, England, Spain, France, Holland, they were the major countries at the time. Any thoughts what were taking place? Yeah, no, the Industrial Revolution came a little bit later, the, the, but not too much later, you're right. But it was really the time of, uh, the colonialization. And so what they would do, and I'm concentrating primarily on the on England, what they would do is send people to the new lands. And the idea was to make sure that we, we exploited the resources. So they were sent to North America. Yeah, coloniz colonialization, exactly. Exactly, Timo. So they, they would, and this is the interesting part, they, they, had, they had this viewpoint in the UK, which was very, very interesting, or in England, was very, very interesting. They had a, what they considered to be a population problem, and they, they said there are too many people in the cities that aren't bringing us any value. So they considered these people also to be wasteland. They considered the people to be wasteland. So what they did was they put them on boats, and they sent them to North America, or they sent them to Australia, and they didn't give them much. <laughs> I think it's to a certain degree, and this is one of the, the myths that we have in North America, the pilgrims and the people that actually went ahead and, and put America together. Actually, the individuals that ended up in America in the beginning had a really terrible life. Really bad, really bad. But this one gets even worse because if we're talking about exploiting land, if we're talking about exploiting people, what else came out at that time that was even worse than sending the colonial, uh, the, 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 the wasted people from England to North America? What else happened at this time that was even worse than all of this? Any ideas? I'm gonna give you a hint. Any idea? Slavery, slavery. And so that was because they thought that if we're not able to go ahead and exploit these these Africans, then they're they have no value for us. And that was the that was the mentality that we had coming out. And it's only today, yeah, only today in the United States we've we starting to come to terms. We have a long ways to go.
And if you're interested in the subject, there's a very interesting project coming out of the New York Times called 1619. Let me go ahead and write that in the, yes, yeah, slavery, you got it, Leonie. Uh, Leonie, uh, 1619, New York Times. Okay, so let's go ahead and continue. And so we did get to, finally to the Industrial Revolution. Let me go ahead and try this now, see how this works. That's too small, let's do this. Then we get to the Industrial Revolution and, and then all of a sudden all these undue consequences were taking place. First step was we took people from the countryside and brought them into the city. Now they might be, they, they were artisans. That meant that they were actually building things, putting putting things together. In my mind, a, a number of them were artists because they were, they had such a, a love of their, their craft and they took so much pride in what they were putting together, but they weren't able to live from it. And so they, they were confronted with a situation Either we go ahead and live in poverty in the countryside or we try to do something better in the city. So what happened is they went, went ahead and moved to the cities and they were said, oh great, you know how to do this, but we're gonna tell you how to do it right. So in other words, they were, affront, they were confronted with, an inf with, a, with a statement that actually didn't leave them a warm, fuzzy feeling, but rather they were, they were told, we're going to tell you how to do this, and you're not going to have to do the whole thing. You just do one part of it, and that's basically how we moved forward with the, with the Industrial Revolution, and we started with the this machine way of working where we had the assembly lines, et cetera, et cetera. And there was another problem that came out from this time of the Industrial Revolution, specifically in the beginning, terrible pollution. If you take a look at these pictures, the depictions from back then, really horrible. Cities like London and Manchester, you could not live in them. And so the individuals in power, the industrialists, the industrialists said, well, don't worry about that because technology is going to solve this problem. So it might be bad now, but it's going to get better. And so then we had a gentleman by the name of Jevon, who, William Jevon, who in 1865 came out with his Jevon's paradox. Let me go ahead and explain to you what Jevon's paradox is all about. The, the idea that what these industrialists were, were actually telling us that we are going through technology make the situation better. What actually happens is it makes things worse because we might come up with better ways to, in this particular case, it was tied to coal. We might be coming up with better ways to manage coal, but Unfortunately, the, the cheaper coal became, the more um, prevalent coal became, then the more coal was actually being used. So yet yeah, in relation, it was getting better, but it was actually getting much worse. And then this example that you see on your screen, let me go ahead and make it bigger for you. Fuel efficiency gains tend to increase, not decrease fuel use. So in other words, if we're able to go ahead and save you money on gasoline, then you feel that you can get into your car more often, you could drive more. And I personally think that there, well, let me talk a little bit about that on the, ne on the next slide. Uh, yeah, uh, Leonie, you're right, it, there's a huge gap, and this is another learning for me on, on this. So, but we, we need to go ahead and try different ways of actually uh, in improving the learning experience. And I thought this was, this was an interesting experience, especially considering uh, that I think Zoom has some, some deficiencies, but regardless, it doesn't matter. Let me go ahead and continue on to the next slide. And this is tied to a concept called uh, induced demand. Now this idea of induced demand uh, it, it takes on different forms. If we think about, there was a time, had to have been around the, the 30s or maybe even the 20s perhaps, where people pretty much already had what they, what they needed. And so the companies needed to figure out a way to sell even more to the individuals. And so you could almost say that that was the, the invention of modern marketing where we were able to go ahead and create goods that nobody really needed, but we, we were convinced that we, 
that we actually absolutely had to have this, this these goods. So if you take a look at this example, let me make sure I'm doing this right. Yes, I am. Okay, if you take a look at this example on your screen, then you'll see that, let me do it this way. You'll see that when we try to improve things, we're actually sometimes making things much worse. Let's start with the example on the top. So we'll have high traffic congestion costs, uh, high, sorry, high traffic congestion, and then the costs that are tied to that. And then we'll figure, oh, then we'll just build new roads. And of course, we have this situation here in Austria. We still, there's always this con uh, conflict about building new roads. And of course, from certain political parties, and unfortunately, it's not just the ones, the, the darker ones, but the latter ones as well. They, they say that we need to we need these new roads because we need them for progress. So we go ahead and buy, build these new roads, and the whole idea is that we actually go ahead and reduce the congestion. But what actually happens is that we make things worse because it, you you've made you've made it so enticing for people. They even use the resource more. So in fact, by trying to correct the mis, the, the situation we're actually making it infinitely worse. And, and, we, and we see this over and over again. Now I'd like to go ahead and talk about a gentleman by the name of Charles Keating. And he was, um, he had a station in Hawaii uh, in the late 50s and was performing a uh, geologist and he was performing different experiments and came across a situation which he thought was quite unusual. He was me measuring uh, carbon dioxide and he noticed that there was a relationship between the, the increasing amounts of CO2 and and what it was actually what was taking place in the environment. And he came up with a model, which was originally called the Keeling curve, where he showed that there are certain times of the year where the CO2 would actually go up, sometimes it would go down, and this was having a this was having the effect on our climate. And of course, as you can imagine, in 1958, nobody wanted to hear this story. And in fact, it took a number of years before. Keeling actually had any acceptance to the Keeling curve. Of course, today we all know that this is true, that one of the points that Keeling brought up was that, that CO2 was actually going into the ocean. And part of the problem with global warming, of course, is the warming of the oceans. And of course, the effect that it actually has. And we know about these problems more in detail today. But we've known this for 63, sorry, Let's do the math, uh, 62 years, 62 years. Now let me go ahead and talk to you about another theory or a concept. It's called Marchetti's constant. Marchetti, uh, this isn't all that old. I think, I believe it came out in 1994. And what Marchetti said was that depending upon which kind of transport you have, then that affects the amount of distance you're actually covering. He believed that you always had this idea that you needed an hour back and forth to wherever you needed to go. So let's assume that you are living in the city and you have and you had to walk. Let's assume you had to walk. Then of course the, the distance you can cover in a half hour wasn't going to be all that great, right? And so with the inception of public transportation, then that meant that you can go much farther in a half hour's time. And then of course we had the invention or the, the propagation of the automobile, which meant that this becomes even more pronounced. And if we look at a situation like for example, in the United States, then that was what we called urban sprawl. And we all know the effect that the automobile has had on on CO2. So now I'm going to ask you a question, and I know I have to be a little bit patient. I get a little bit too, I get too impatient. I'm going to ask you, to what degree do you think that the that self-driving cars are going to solve the problem? 
the problem that Marchetti's talking about with the half hour, because in essence, if you're not driving, you could do whatever you want, right? Does this solve the problem that we we have tied to congestion and pollution? So you think that the congestion will get better if we have self-driving cars? Did I get that right? Okay, Leonie, I think it's not really solving the problem at its root. Better to focus on expanding public transport. Thank you. Any other thoughts? Okay. <laughs> okay, I'm going to come up with my with my prognosis. Oh, really? Okay. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, I bet you there's going to be huge. There's going to be huge congestion. I'll tell you why. Because people are going to be freed of actually having to drive. That means that they could be moving all the time, and they don't have to consider them. They don't have to consider uh, how do they get from A to B. They go ahead and program the car. And this is my prognosis, and and I'd be keen on, on your. Um, oh yeah, sorry. Is the is the self driving car electric, electric or combustion? I'm going to assume it's going to be electric. But is the is the gas is the um, is the fuel that we use in the car is that the only source of pollution for the cars? Do you think that we have any other sources of pollution for the cars? I'll leave that question, but let me go ahead and you can think about it and respond. Uh, but let me give you my scenario that I think is going to happen. We are going to live in these cars. The cars are going to be our new offices. Why? Because, of course, we can. it's going to be an office on wheels. We'll be going... It's going to be a real pollutant. Yes, I agree. Don't even talk about the tires. You know what? How much how much um, microplastic is actually created by tires? It's it's a serious problem. And of course, nobody really talks about this one. But but think think of, and think about the energy. Of course, think about the energy that we have to go ahead and create to to get these cars going. And think about um, Jevon's par paradox that we technology is supposed to help us, but actually it hurts us because we have to produce so much energy to keep these self-driving cars going, especially considering looking at what we have on your screen, Marchetti's constant. This is what I think is going to happen. Marchetti, Marchetti's constant goes out the window because we don't consider our, that, that, um, that transport time is being downtime because we don't have to drive anymore. That means that our cars become our new offices, and we will go ahead and tell the car, oh, go ahead and take me there, or go ahead and take me there. And then, you, of course, you're making calls. You're probably on the Internet the whole time, and you're constantly moving. I say, oh, well, let's, let's go ahead and visit these people. Let's go ahead and go here. And I tend to think that you're just going to have a bunch of people moving all the time. I don't even want to think about all the congestion that's going to come through because of self-driving cars. I mentioned the whole concept of pollution coming from tires. Don't even talk about the aggravation that's going to be coming out of, of self-driving cars. And I raise the question to you, what do you think of as far as quality of life? This might sound great, but think about all those things that I've talked, to, talked about so far. 
the whole the whole idea of Jevons paradox that technology you think is going to make it better it actually makes it worse if we talk about induced demand do we actually need this do we need this and then of course Marchetti's constant goes out the window and basically this is and it's even worse I think there's a couple either a couple of points I need to go ahead and write, raise here have you ever heard of the 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 um, the statement is called the driverless industrial complex. I heard this one recently. I thought it was quite interesting. And to, up till now, we've had the, the traditional industry working with the military, and that's basically how the economy has been working. Now, we, now we'll have a situation, but it's all being managed from Silicon Valley, and we're paying with our data. <laughs> Sound like a real interesting future that we have ourselves tied up to, tied up with. So there is another phrase that I'd like to go ahead and raise here. It's called a progress trap. Let me explain to you what a prog uh, what a progress trap is. Thank you very much for those last comments. I really appreciate it. The um, we keep thinking that there's a relationship. Let me go ahead and do this. There is a relationship between quality of life and progress. That means we think for our lives to actually improve quality-wise, that we need to make continual progress. And of course, we've seen this through the inception of the internet. And please don't get me wrong, I'm not a, I'm not a Luddite. I think it's very important that we do make progress technology-wise. But the real problem is that we, we, we need to beware the unintended. We go ahead and create something we don't know really what's gonna come out of it. And of course, where do we find ourselves today? If we look at the whole concept of social media, if we look at the, the problem of attention spans, if we look at the problem tied to communication or the lack thereof, uh, and and I, I would say this is probably from my opinion, and I'd be keen for you to just go ahead and share information in the chat box, whatever um, you think of, of this subject. For, for me, this is not necessarily quality of life. Quality of life for me is when I'm able to go ahead and, and have a conversation with you and, and tell you something and what, what I'm thinking of, and, and you're able to go ahead and take it on and give me comments like you're giving me today in explaining it from your perspective, which is of course beautiful because you only you can explain it from your perspective. That's, that's the uniqueness of the human being. For, for me, that's quality of life. That's quality of life. And I don't necessarily know whether progress allows us to go ahead and keep that. What I would hope for all of us is that we have a f truly a free choice to go ahead and define what kind of world we want to live in and, and we manage the technology instead of the technology managing us. Oh yeah, the, thank you very much, Leonie. Yes, that's right. The social dilemma clearly covers this subject. And I think that the, for me, all of these things are, are pretty much tied together. So what I'd like to do is go ahead and talk to you about a few milestones. Um, again, this might be a little bit biased. I come up with some examples coming from the United States, but I, I have a way to actually go ahead and, and bring in a little bit more to a local situation. So the first one that I'd like to go ahead and talk about and let me go ahead and do it this way. It's called the Santa Barbara oil spill. And this is, I'm showing my age. I actually remember the Santa Barbara oil spill. And it took place in January, February, 1969. And it was huge. It was huge. And it was so bad that the people in California said, we will not accept any offshore oil drilling anymore. And in fact, there was a, ser a serious problem because the, the whole ecosystem around Santa Barbara totally died. And I remember the pictures of the birds totally covered in with oil. And of course, they didn't have a, a very long life. And here I'm going to go ahead and tell you um, a tidbit of information that it has something to do with the Santa Barbara 
uh, towers or the, the oil towers. I'm going to assume that some of you at least have heard of a group called The Doors, maybe heard of Jim Morrison, who was the singer of The Doors. Well, there was one time he used to hang out in that area, and I guess he was taking some sort of uh, illicit substance. I don't know which one it was, but he was tripping out, looking at these towers from the beach, and he wrote the song Riders of the Storm. Uh, because he he was actually talking, he thought that the writers were the the oil tower, uh, the, the oil towers, and so um, that's how the that was the inspiration of the song "Writers of the Storm" coming from Jim Morrison, and so that for me that was a milestone, the Santa Barbara oil spill, and we had a number of these issues that came up in 1969. The next one would be the. Cuyahoga River Fire, and this is was on Lake Erie, actually, um, in June of 69, and people could not believe that a river can catch on fire. And what really happened, of course, there was so much pollution in this river that it was very easy for the, the river to catch on fire. And it was at this point in time, we talked a little bit about last this last week, there was a bit of an issue tied to uh, playing the the video from, from YouTube. But I, I talked a little bit about Earth Day. And, and just to put things in perspective, we had these two examples of what took place. We had the Santa Barbara oil spill that took place in January, February of 1969. And then you had the, the fire on Lake Erie in June of 69, and then we had a year later, we had Earth Day. So people were starting to realize that all of this was having an effect on them, and they needed to go ahead and do something very serious. So let's go ahead and move on. And so there's got to be a better way. And these examples I'll be giving you are covering different areas, um, but I, I wanted to go ahead and put them in some sort of uh, chronological order. In spite of the 70s being the me generation, there was a lot of experimentation taking place. And there's one that I'd like to talk to you about is called uh, industrial ecology. That was the term that was given to it later on. But it was basically trying to figure out a way, for me it was kind of the one of the precursors of the whole idea of circularity. How do we go ahead and make sure that we continue using the materials as long as possible? And so this was coming from uh, a town called Kalundborg in Denmark. And they started this, this enterprise back in 1972 and it was all tied to this power station, the one that you see in the middle of your screen. And it took them a long time to actually go ahead and develop the infrastructure. What you see right here only really came into fruition maybe about 20 years after they started. But what they did was they took various businesses and they part of the, the they actually brought the, the businesses in to the area to build up this ecosystem. So let's go ahead and take a look at some of the things that you find on your screen that we have elements between the power station and the stat oil refinery that we have the steam from the power station goes to the refinery creating energy. We have the cooling water from the refinery going back to the power station. The wastewater actually went back to the power station and the gas they were creating from the refinery also went back to the power station. And then we had a plasterboard manufacturer who was taking, taking the, the gas from the refinery. We had some other elements. I don't need to go into all the details, but you saw that an ecosystem was built where they were supporting each other depending upon what they, what they didn't need anymore, what they considered to be waste, well, maybe there was somebody else within this construction who could actually go ahead, who could actually go ahead and use the material. So this was one of the first experiments that we've had in trying to see, well, if this, if I don't need this anymore, but maybe somebody else does. So let's try to see if we can come up with a model where we can ex ex uh, make sure that the, the, the material stays more in circulation. And this was one of the first times that we actually tried to put something like this together. And I have an example of something that we have taking place in Vienna. It's in the 10th district and it's called uh, Zukunftshof. And it's pretty much on the border with 
uh, Lower Austria, and they're trying to go ahead and create a similar situation. So whatever is created here, it looks a little bit barren, uh, is still in in the not necessarily in the concept mode. They've actually done a fair amount, but they have a long ways to go, and there's a lot of work that's required. But the, the whole idea is to have different businesses that are working together. So if I have something I'm producing and I and I don't need it anymore, and you can actually go ahead and use it, how do we go ahead and build an ecosystem that it just works? And I do believe that this is the precursor the first precursor of the circular economy, let's go this route, this is the first precursor of the circular economy because if we think of this idea of reverse logistics and bringing things back, well, they build a system that it just kind of happens. And each of the businesses profits from that of what the other can actually offer, and it just kind of works. So I think this is the big challenge that we have. Can't we come up with a system where we're able to go ahead and make sure that the things that I don't knew, I don't need anymore, that somebody else can use them, and we we build an ecosystem, and we can add some sort of uh, incentive to this model, and it just kind of works. And I think that's really the challenge that we need to go ahead and work on. All right, continue on our journey here. the The next stop would be in 1978. I need to go ahead and check this. Let's go ahead and do this. Okay. Um, a concept is called permaculture. This was coming from two gentlemen um, by the name of Bill Mollison and David Holmgren. And they were actually living in Tasmania. I don't know if you're familiar where Tasmania is. It's a small island off the coast as part of Australia. Very different than the rest of Australia, if you ever get there. And I have another example from Tasmania a little bit later on. And they built a, a system that I think was really, really powerful. I'm not gonna go into full details on all of these concepts because it will take way, way too much time. But uh, as you can see on the, the outer circle, we have different steps that need to take place. Uh, for example, observe and interact. So it's a mindset. Catch and store energy, obtain a yield. So in other words, are you able to go ahead and produce something with value? That's what they're referring to. Uh, apply self-regulation, accept feedback. So again, this is all part of a, of a mindset. And the key that I really like to go ahead and focus on is this part in the, in the middle, the fair share, people care, and earth care. And I think this is, for me, this is one of the most powerful models that you can come up with. Um, and in fact, I was talking to one of you a little bit about an economic model that's kind of tied on this. So we have care for the earth, we have care for people, and return the surplus. So what are we actually talking about here? Care for the earth, care for people, and return the surplus. So think about this idea that I mentioned earlier about the bank account. So then we can actually go ahead and we have a surplus, we can go ahead and invest it in something else. But as long as we keep things in circulation, then it's fine and we make sure that we take care of the earth and people, and if we, with the yield that I was talking about, if it's brought back, then the system kind of just works on its own. And in fact, we, we can find this not just within the concept of permaculture, but if we can look at economic models, that we have the same thing taking place. And there was an example I gave um, last week to one of you, that it was all tied to the one of the, um, the first alternative currencies that existed in the 20th century it came from a town in Tirol called Virgle. And in 1931, they, the mayor had a serious problem. He had, I can't remember exactly the amount that he, that he had at his disposal. He could have started some sort of project where he might have been, been able to employ a few people, but not very many, and it would be for a sh short period of time. Or what he could do was take that fund and create an alternate currency. And so he decided to go follow the second route. And the idea, I don't know if it directly came from the mayor, but whoever came up with this idea was, was truly very, very smart. The key to the, this alternative currency in Virgin was that it had an expiration date. That meant that you always had to go ahead and spend it. We know that these things are finite. 
And so we don't, uh, the last thing we want to do is be holding a bunch of notes that have no value. So because of this expiration date, the money kept circulating in the system. And that meant that uh, everybody was able to go ahead and profit from it because nobody sat on the money. Let's go back to the examples that I talked about earlier tied to Aristotle, uh, going back to the models from Aristotle, where he talked about uh, the original meaning of economy and then this concept of the theory of wealth. So within the concept that they built in, um, in Virgin, they, they had this expiration date for the money. So it was constantly in circulation. I see a clear parallel between this model that I'm showing you on the screen and what they were trying to do there. Unfortunately, with Virgil, uh, the, the Nazi Bank wasn't too happy about that. And so they eventually forced the Virgil to discontinue the experiment with their alternate currency. Unfortunately, okay, so here's some other examples. And I'm going to go ahead here and come up with a few parallels. Let's go do it this way. This is called Three Mile Island. And I'd be very curious, probably because I'm showing my age, if you want to go ahead and write in the chat and let me know if you've ever heard of this example. Let me go ahead and tell you what took place in March of 1979. There was um, a nuclear reactor in a town in Pennsylvania. It was called Three Mile Island, and they had an accident. And it was a big news. I was in the university at the time. And it was the first time, like the example I gave you with the Santa, Santa Barbara oil spill and then the, the fire on, on Lake Erie, this was another milestone. Although I, I can remember back then, we were protesting against nuclear power in the 1970s. Yes, we did have pro protests in the United States. We had plenty of protests in the United States. and But it took something like Three Mile Island to actually go ahead and change the way that we looked at things to say that maybe this is not the best solution, then we finally started to realize the danger. And we're, you might be seeing a parallel in all these examples that I'm giving you, and especially if we look at it from the concept of global warming. We didn't see a problem. We certainly didn't see it with the Keeling curve, with that Keeling was off his rocker, and we're only later on were we willing to give him credit for what he was talking about. And then we had the, the oil spill, then we had uh, the fire on Lake Erie, and now we have Three Mile Island, and we're starting to realize that we cannot control nature like we thought we could. And we started making some decisions. In fact, since that period of time, there have there's been more or less a moratorium in building nuclear reactors in the United States. But there was an, something that took place here in Austria, very close to this date, that I consider to be a milestone as well. Milestone for this country, um, very strong statement here in Europe. And it's one of those things that I think the Austrians should really be proud of. Does anybody know what that could have been? I'll go ahead and continue with the conversation, but I'd be keen to see if anybody will guess it, and then I'll give you a couple minutes. I'll take a look at the chat box and see if maybe you might have guessed what it was. And if not, then I'll go ahead and tell you what, what actually came through. Good, let's continue. I told you I was gonna come up with another example from, Austra uh, from Australia and specifically tied to Tasmania. There was a project that was started in the early 80s to go ahead and build a dam in an area of Australia is really beautiful. That uh, it's a, a tropical rainforest. It's one of the two tropical rainforests in temperate climates in the entire world. And so the, yes, you got it, Michelle, correct, Svetendorf, that was it, 1978. The, uh, congratulations. Uh, the, and so the Australian government more or less made the decision to go ahead and build this dam. And the Australians decided to go ahead and fight it. And it was a dirty fight. I actually went to this area a number of years ago and I heard the story. And the, the people in power were not very kind to the pro protesters. But at the end, people won, people won. Now I'm gonna ask you another question. I'm giving you, this is almost like an Austrian history test here. Can anybody think of a similar action that took place a little bit after the 1982, which was also, I would consider it to be a watershed 
here in Austrian history that had similar parallels? I'll leave that to you and you can go ahead and fill it in the chat box and I will continue with my description. And again, I'm, I'm working on this in chronological. They made, made a bit of a jump here. We moved on to the early 2000s. The original concept was formed, I believe, around 2002, if I got it right, called Cradle to Cradle. And this came from two gentlemen, a German and an American, uh, Michael Braungartner and William de Gu McDougall. And what they did was they, they tried to make the case from that biological cycle that I, that I talked about earlier to be found within the butter, butterfly diagram. And so they, they, built a, they built a model that allowed us to go ahead and try to see whether everything that we create, whether it's a nutrient. So if it's a nutrient and it's biological, that means it could actually go ahead and rot and it doesn't matter. And so the idea was from, from uh, Braungartner and in um, and McDougall is to actually go ahead and move things from the technical cycle more onto the biological cycle. They might disagree <laughs> with the with my description, but that basically is what they were doing. And in fact, the whole idea of cradle to cradle has been around for a long time. Um, they're working primarily with corporations. There are corporations that. Um, also some here in Austria that are certified cradle to cradle, but that was really the next big step. But it was focusing primarily on making sure that we build things where it's primarily a nutrient. Yes, Timo, you got it. Han, it's Heidenburg. Right, excellent, very good, congratulations. Yes, Misha, you got it as well. Fantastic. Cool, let's go ahead and continue. Ah, now I move on to the next stop, and it's called uh, biomimetics. And this this came from a gentleman uh, in the 1950s, Otto Schmidt, who was American, but he had a German name, and he did some experiments on on squids in under trying to understand nerve systems. And his first description was. Um, Bio, biophysics, and then he came up with the term biomimetics. And the whole idea, and then of course, we, you might've heard of the, the term biomimicry, which has become somewhat popular, more recent phenomena, and that was more or less concentrating on under, how can, can we go ahead and recreate what nature is doing? We use nature as an inspiration for us to actually go ahead and solve some deep-seated problems that we have. And, and within biomimicry, let's start with the biomimicry. There are three com components. Is can we go ahead and mimic that or recreate that of what nature is doing? Can we be aware or show empathy in all those things that, that nature needs and that we're not causing more damage, damage going back to this whole concept of um, progress trap? And then lastly, can we can we go ahead and emulate ourselves back into a system where we're more in link with nature in in in, in trying to go back to those things that we already know but we've kind of lost our way and the, for me those are the basic components of biomimicry and that has been one of the latest trends and uh, within the the link that I sent you, I have some additional information. I was gonna go ahead and share that with you anyways. But I think that that is pretty much where we are before actually getting to the concept of the circular economy, which is pretty much coming from the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. And I have something at the end of our, of our session today. Um, for those of you who are interested, they're really interested in, in the subject of circular economy, looking at it from the perspective directly from the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. They're actually starting with a course as well, starting on the 28th of October, uh, explaining the circular economy from, from their perspective. And so Ellen MacArthur did a very industrious woman who actually sailed around the world and what she was able to find on that trip was very unsettling for her. And after 
her taking that sailing trip, she realized that she needed to make this her life vocation and actually going ahead and cleaning up this mess that we've created throughout the years and trying to come up with, with a better way for us to go ahead and manage this. And from that perspective, I would consider her to be the, um, the main trigger when we when we start talking about the circular economy. But of course, as you might have noticed in all of these examples that I was giving, either looking at from an industrial ecology perspective, the example coming out of Denmark and, the, and piggybacking on what they're doing in the Sukhumthof, and there are others out there. Going from there to permaculture and the whole idea of taking care of the earth, taking care of people, and making sure that we return the surplus. I can actually do it this way. Uh, oh no, let's go the other way. You can't read the slides. And then, of course, cradle to cradle, which I just um, described to you. And this idea that everything is a nutrient. And so we need to go, and it's starting from the design, we need to make sure that we design these things properly so that we, we use materials that can always be brought back into the system. And then it doesn't even matter about the reverse logistics because it's all nutrients. You don't have to worry about it. And I think when I really look at the certain things that I really like about Cradle to Cradle, and one of them is that if everything's a nutrient, does, does nature actually go ahead and provide us with everything we need? And I gave an example last week in the garden house of my mother-in-law and in the, the cherry tree that I talked about. And in fact, I even looked at it this morning. We're still getting these cherries coming out of the tree in the middle of October. And of course they all dried up and now the rain has made them all soggy but they're still there. That was so much that was produced that there was no way in the world we we're gonna eat it at all. And if we were to look at what nature is able to go ahead and provide us, and if we are able to come up with systems where we live with nature instead of against nature, and, and stop thinking that we have the, these limits, the limits that we're really talking about and is, is on this, this way of life that is, that is actually going ahead and producing poison and forcing us to go ahead and be in competition with nature. We know this take, make, dispose model cannot work. Everybody knows this, but it, we need to go ahead and do something about it. And then the last example, which I think has been around for a while, biomimicry is maybe not necessarily called that. If you took up all of this, this is kind of where we find ourselves tied to the circular economy. And that was really what I think that these, what the circular economy is pretty much made of, looking at from a historical perspective, understanding understanding the actual sources. So why now? Why is it popular now? Why is this a cause that we can consider uh, being viable today? Well, we've seen a number of changes over the, over the last couple of years. Obviously, it, if we observe the Fridays for Future movement where people in your generation or maybe even a little bit younger than your generations are realizing that there's, there's no future for them. So they, if, they're, if they don't do something, then it's lost. So I think we're starting to see a change taking place and people starting to realize that this is a, a very important subject. The whole idea of digitalization and that digitalization can be used as a motor to allow us to maybe create less or for those things that, we're, that we create that we can keep track of them better. And so digitalization plays a role. There's a, a subject that I think is very, very fascinating and I think I mentioned it last week. I'll be doing a live stream on this one in a few weeks time tied to sustainable finance. That means if we're able to go ahead and make sure that our investments are in the right things, going back to the idea of permaculture, return the surplus, then basically that's what finance is or what it should be, returning the surplus so that we're actually getting something in our investment. Now, if we make sure that our investments are done in a sustainable fashion, then then we're creating not only models that work and, and we don't have to think about it, but that we're getting a little bit closer to creating that world that we want to live in. I think there's a lot of pressure 
coming on companies today to um, to actually go ahead and deliver, which was not necessarily the case before. And finally, although they're very, very slow, and I had a discussion with, with one of you on this one as well, as far as the, the last election that we had on, on Sunday and what kind of damage could possibly be caused if we had a, a, a red government, a pure red government here in, in Vienna. Uh, the governments are actually starting to react, but they won't do it on their own. They need pressure, and that's where you and I come into play. And then the, this is going to be the last part that I concentrate on. It, and I think this this model for me that this describes a lot. Um, right now, we have a model where degre degradation means that we're destroying things. We take things and we just destroy them. If you look at the take, make, dispose model, that's a model of degradation. What we need to do is come up with a system tied to rest restoration that we make sure that whatever we take that we're able to go ahead and bring back and we can uh, make sure that we stay within the cycle. No, it doesn't always have to be a, a pure cycle. In fact, when we talk about circularity, very often it's more of an ecosystem where we have different parts. Think about the model that I showed you coming out of Denmark with the industrial ecology. That is not a circle. That is an ecosystem where different parts are taking place. And I, I believe that that's really the direction that we need to look in, if making sure that everything can be returned in some fashion. We work on primary resources, not secondary resources. And that we always keep in mind, how do we go ahead and make sure that we, that we, we have a focus on restoration, not on degradation? Okay, so that would be it for my presentation today. Um, again, this was a very in interesting uh, experience for me. I thank you for um, staying the whole time. I, I, can, I can track you in the fact that I can see how many people are there and a number of you are there. So I appreciate you coming. So I'm going to raise the question. I don't expect anything in the chat box, uh, but uh, maybe if you can get back to me. I, I did see that there was um, at least one participant who's going to take place in the inner days. So they, it's still not too late if you want to go ahead and participate. Uh, and so the option for you would be as follows, either being part of the hackathon or that you work on a project on uh, some sort of small circular business. Now, let me go ahead and I know this question's gonna come, so I'm gonna go ahead and explain to you what I'm kind of thinking here. So if we say that we need to put a, an emphasis on the economy part of the circular economy and we're, we're concentrating on coming up with something that's sustainable. That means that whatever we take is being able to be brought back. And I, I personally believe, and as I mentioned to you last week, and this is my wish, my goal for you, is that we can actually go ahead and come up with something where you could do what you want, do something good, and you can live from it. And so this is the this is the motivation for me, and I hope for some of you it's, it's also a motivation that can take on different forms. Can you come up with some sort of business that allows you to go ahead and work with circularity and and take advantage of the opportunity for us to see if we can try to put something together for you, um, or you put something together and I help you along the way is actually better said, and take advantage of the opportunity of these few, these weeks that we have together to see whether you have something tangible that you could actually run with. And that would make me, that would be a great story. So that would be my hope. Um, the idea is not to, to put in certain criteria to say, did you do a good job or did you not do a good job? To be honest, I don't care about any of that stuff. The whole idea is learning. The whole idea is that you're able to go ahead and and, and move forward. And I, I want to create an environment where you feel that you can actually do this here. And I see that as being my job and that's clearly my wish. So if you have any particular questions, let me go back to the slide. Uh, what I'd like you to do is kind of see who would you like to go ahead and work with? We This is part of the learning from the last time that I put some teams together and they there was more conflict than anything else. And I think that 
probably easier if I just kind of go ahead and leave it to you. And you, you could even do a team of one if you want, but I think it's a little bit more fun if you do it together. So can you go ahead and, and, and get together and, and brainstorm? What I'd like to do is kind of talk about this. So it's gonna be less of a lecture and I'm, I already realized that the next time I'm gonna do this a little bit different. So as part of my learning for today, because the, the lag time is, is, is way too big. Um, and what I'd like to do is talk about that on the 21st. So either you're interested in going ahead and per participating in the Inno Days, uh, go ahead and make the submission. I will be at the lecture later on to get today with Michael uh, and hope that a number of you will actually go ahead and join us. I think it would be very, very interesting. He's an interesting guy. And, and otherwise, then I would say we'll go ahead and do a Zoom session. I have a whole slew of exercises that have not shown up on the mirror board yet that I wanna go ahead and perform with you next week. So if you can come prepared on Wednesday next week to go ahead and talk about what kind of projects you like to do, and then we can spend some time talking about that. And if you're still confused, or confused is the wrong word, if you're still not sure, if you're not sure of maybe what you might wanna do or maybe how to approach things, there is always one solution. Go look for me. And so you know you know where to find me, so please feel free to go ahead and hunt me down. And of course, I enjoy talking to you and, and want to make sure that I can help you. And that ain't, no, that ain't no joke. I mean it seriously, and those people that have worked with me so far uh, know that I'm, I'm damn serious when it comes to this. So please feel free to go ahead and reach out to me. And I would say for us, and that was... Uh, hour and a half of listening to me, you definitely need a break. Um, please feel free to reach out to me. I will be uh, attending the lecture later on today and hope to see, hope that some of you can actually go ahead and make it as well. Otherwise, I say have a wonderful week and any feedback that you like to go ahead and give me about this session, I would be very appreciative because I have my ideas of how things worked out. I, but maybe I might be a little bit too critical, or maybe there might be some other things that I missed in in this presentation mode. One of the things, and here I'm getting, I'm kind of deviating, but this is really important to me. You know, ever since the, the lockdown, where we have not been able to go ahead and sit, uh, be together, this has been a, a bit of an issue that, on, on the one hand, in the, in the beginning, and I noticed this, I teach a number of courses, in the beginning, the, it was almost like a, we were shell-shocked, trying, what the hell is this? How do we go ahead and move forward? And I saw through time, it became more and more difficult. The, the schools, the universities didn't know how to manage this, so they thought, well, if we don't give you work to do, then you have nothing to do. So you got bombarded, and I think a number of you were spared, at least you were spared on the university level, but some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. You got bombarded with things that you needed to do, which brought, in my opinion, little to no value whatsoever. It was what we say in German, a Beschäftigungspolitik. And that's not learning. And at the same time, it was always showtime where you always had to have the video on. And I noticed at the end that people didn't want to turn the video on. And I understand, I understand completely because after a while you get Zoom fatigue, you get sick and tired of always having the video on. So I'm always looking to see, are there better ways to actually go ahead and do this where you don't feel that you have to, it's always showtime for you, that maybe you can um, you could you could just observe what's being talked about or you can actually go ahead and contribute. And part of what I'm trying to do is figure out, are there better models for us to actually go ahead and do this? Because that's what I'm striving for. This situation is not going to change, um, certainly not going to change for a while, unfortunately. And even after this, the, the situation with uh, COVID-19 is actually corrected, our world is not going to be the same. And so we need to figure out ways to build it in our image and so I'm experimenting all the time to see, so how can we actually go ahead and do this? So any, in fact, oh yeah, this is really cool. I didn't even think about this. This is another, I'm gonna perform another exercise 
probably on Monday, and this is completely optional, but let me go ahead and explain this because I have a captive audience and thank goodness you didn't leave, you're still around. Um, what I'd like to do is figure out a way, how do we go ahead and manage this online and offline much better? So in other words, I don't know if you've ever been in this situation, I've gone through this my entire career where I've had some people that I've had in the same room and then there were other people who could not actually go ahead and attend the meeting and so they were trying to join us online. And you know what happens every single time? The people that are physically together, they start talking to each other and then they forget about the others. So it never really works. Now today we have a situation we all have to be online. So that means that uh, we're, we're still trying to figure out how best do we go ahead and manage this, but just the same, we're all within the same con situation. Now I'm running across a challenge and I perhaps some of you have also run across the same challenge that sometimes you need to actually be physically somewhere and sometimes you don't. And, and sometimes you cannot be there for other reasons, but you still don't want to go ahead and not take part. So what I've made as, as uh, my commitment to the, the students that I'm teaching that very possibly where we're physically going to be together, if you do not want to be there for whatever reason, and personally, it's I don't really even care whether you're physically there or if you're virtually there, um, and, or if you think, you know what, this is a little bit too risky. I don't feel that it's good for me to have to go into the university. And I think that these, all of these things need to be respected. But we still need to solve the problem of this online and offline. So what I think I'm going to do, I'm still trying to work this out. I think I'm going to do is try to perform some co-creation. And I'm going to put together a Zoom session. This is what I'm thinking probably on Monday night. And I'm going to do it on a mirror board. And so I'm going to get different people together that are that I'm going to pose this question: How do we go ahead and solve the problem of online and off online and offline being brought together? And I want to use it as a brainstorming session, not too dissimilar to some of the things that we did in our last one. Um, I'll have to think a little bit about what the, the the structure will look like. But at the end, what I'd like to do is see so. What did you think of? What do you think would be an approach you can you can take? Because there's one thing I've noticed, and I hope that this is a big takeaway for all of you. You know, it I as an individual might have an idea. And it might be good, or maybe it's not that good. But the fact is, if we all think about it together, the the results of all of us thinking about it is gonna be much better than what I can think of my own. Why? because you are you and that's what makes you unique and, not, and, and and you can only come up with ideas that only you can come up with. I could never come up with them. And for me, that's a benefit. I really, I appreciate that. And I appreciate every time that we can go ahead and try to come up with solutions together because I'm no better or any worse than anybody else and neither are you. So why don't we go ahead and try to join forces and I'll, what I'll do is I'll ask some of the students from some of the other universities I'm teaching at if they wanna go ahead and participate. So it will be a, a mixed group. We'll do it in English for sure because I'm teaching other courses where they don't even speak German. So it'll have to be in English. And then what we'll do is um, I'll, we'll use a mirror board and I'll go ahead and put people into breakout rooms, probably try to take concepts and have you switch around a little bit. Won't be that long. It can't be that long. People, everybody will get impatient. So I'll probably try to set it like for an hour. So if anybody's interested in participating, for net, let's do it a different way. If you think it's an interesting idea, please tell me because I have no idea whether this is worth pursuing or not. I think it is, but I might be wrong, but I'm really keen on your opinion. So please feel free to go ahead and reach out to me and let me know. And then of course, if you're interested in being part of something like that, probably I'm kind of thinking, and I'm open to suggestions here too, maybe about 1900. I think anything else would be too late. Anything else earlier than that would be too early, maybe 1930, latest 2000. But um, yeah, I'd be keen on your feedback. And um, yeah, thank you very much. I hope you were able to get something out of today. 
And I certainly learned a lot. I <laughs> learned the things that I'm not going to do the next time. So that's always good stuff. And look forward to seeing as many of you as possible in the session later at 1700. Thank you.